Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this morning, I would like to talk about how HTTP applications are just a Claisley function from a streaming request to a polymorphic effect of a streaming response. So what's the problem? Uh, a few words about myself. I'm not going to read all of this to you. I will throw in a couple of bonus facts on top of what's already on the slide. Uh, first of all, I am very much an introvert. Uh, second of all, I was born and raised in the Midwest. And the reason I tell you both of those is they both relate in the fact that I hate talking about myself and cannot wait to get started talking about the code. <laughs> so let's go do it. Uh, what is HTTP for S? So HTTP for S was started by a bunch of us Scalatra developers. Uh, it's a project that I used to work on. And we were very tightly coupled to the servlet API at the time. There was no way to run Scalatra without talking directly to HTTP servlet request, HTTP servlet response. And we had a lot of people who wanted to run it on a Netty backend at the time. And we looked around at other languages, and every other language has this concept where you've got a mapping of a request to a response. Maybe it's a pure function with types, or maybe it's just this abstract definition where you've got dynamic types and things can be impure. But almost every other language has that. In Clojure, you've got Ring. In Ruby, you've got React. Python has WSGI. Our closest cousin is Haskell that has WAI. There was nothing like that in Scala. So we set out to build that for Scala. And as far as that initial goal went, we failed kind of miserably because today Scalatra does not run on HTTP for S and we don't have a nutty backend for HTTP for S. However, conceptually, we were very successful in that. So an HTTP for S API, it can be defined in multiple ways. We've got a DSL that we provide as part of the core package. It's based on pattern matching. It looks a lot like unfiltered, which has a tradition here in the Northeast. We have another way of expressing APIs called row, which uh, does a bunch of type level style of computations, and you're able to take your service definition and compile it down directly into Swagger documentation. And if you don't want all that type level hackery, and if you don't want any syntactic sugar for extractors, you can just write things as a pure function as well. And you can take all of those kinds of API definitions, and you can run them on your choice of backend. So we provided something called Blaze. One of our contributors, Bryce Anderson, wrote that. It's an NIO library. It sits in about the same space as Netty, but he wanted to learn how to do NIO. He thought he could do better than Netty. I don't know that he did better than Netty, but he did very well, and it works well for us. So that's our native backend. And we also have Jetty and Tomcat, so if you want to run on a raw servlet container, if you still do war deployments here in 2018, we got you covered on that too. Uh, as far as a client goes, we have the same model for requests and responses that you can use both on the server side and on the client side. So we offer a client also on top of our Blaze backend. That's the one that most people use. We also have a wrapper around async HTTP client, and we hopefully have more on the way for both of those. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out with a very naive conception of what it is to be an HTTP application. We're going to say an HTTP application is just a function from a request to a response. How far can we get with something as simple as that? Let's define a hello world API. And we're going to just use pattern matching for our requests and responses. It's a nice, simple way that we can develop some APIs here together in a slideshow. So if you post to the hello endpoint, we're going to capture the name that you post, and we're going to respond with hello. Otherwise, we respond with not found. Fairly easy to read. Let's go ahead and unit test this. And we post to the hello endpoint with Boston, and we get back hello Boston as a body. So we're already seeing some of the virtues of pure functional programming. We didn't have to fire up a server inside of CI to do integration tests. We can do uh, very lean unit tests. We don't need to have Mockito to uh, mock any complicated request and response APIs. All it is is there's a simple definition of a request, a simple definition of a response, and a pure function. And it's so easy to unit test. It's just a function call. That's all you have to do. We already got our first benefit of functional programming. And let's load test this. This is something that if all you're doing, if you have a nice synchronous backend, this is something that's going to work very well for a certain kind of app. But not everything works that way. It's very common that when you're implementing an API, you need to make network calls. You're assembling a response out of other things. Maybe you're calling off to a network service. So let's say we have a contract with a translation service. So they translate text for us. And we've got a future-based interface for that client, so translator.future. Let's take that text, and then we need to turn that into an HTTP response. That doesn't work out so well, because our shape says that we have to return a response, but we have a response in the future, so we have to await it. Does it work? Yeah, it works. We can still post with one and get back uno, so that's good. 
but we are blocking threads. A weight is bad and you should feel bad. Anytime that you find yourself having to do a weight, you have made a bad design decision. So we're going to need to refine our conception of what an HTTP application looks like. And simple enough, let's just go ahead and say, okay, a lot of our backends operate in the context of a future, so why don't we operate in the context of a future? And now we can see when we call that future, all we do is we wait for that response to come back. We don't need to block a thread. We wait for the response to come back from that service and we map it to an HTTP response. Our unit test has changed a little bit. Instead of just an assert, we need to do an async assert. That's really no big deal. Scala test and specs too and mini test, those are all good at doing asynchronous assertions as well. So really no burden there. We're testing things in the future. And now we have something, I think this is certifiably a reactive HTTP library at this point. It works inside of futures. So we're making progress here. Another thing that we often want to do is we want to combine applications. So maybe you've got a lot of routes and you want to divide them up conceptually. Like you've got two different kinds of resources and you want to split up the CRUD routes for maintainability. Or maybe you've got a standard health check endpoint that works with your own infrastructure and you're expecting health checks to respond in a certain format at a certain place and you want to compose that onto all your services throughout your company. It's very useful to be able to take two HTTP apps and combine them. But the signature that we have right now is kind of hostile to that. The best we can do is we drop those wildcard cases from our HTTP app. And then what we do is we have this combine function. And what it does is it calls the first service. And if the first service throws a match error, then we call the second service. Does it work? Well, when we post to Boston, we get, or, or sorry, when we post to hello, we get hello Boston. When we post to hola, we get hola Boston. So yeah, it works, but again, we feel bad about ourselves because this whole thing is based on catching an exception for control flow that isn't even documented anywhere that it can be thrown. So again, we've got something that works, but it, like the await, it's a bad solution. Scala has this idea of partial functions, which are good. With the partial function, what you're expressing via the type system is I'm saying that Everything is a partial mapping of requests to responses. I don't handle all requests, but I handle these requests. So we're going to define this idea and say that HTTP routes are a partial function of request to responses. At the end, the server still needs a full mapping. So HTTP application is unchanged, but we're going to introduce this concept of HTTP routes. And when we put that together, we can see our combine gets a lot nicer now. We don't have to catch an exception for control flow. We just have this simple or else it's built right into partial functions. Now we combine those two services and when we combine those, we get an HTTP app out of it. This is still bad because what happens if we post to a language that isn't supported yet? We've got English, we got Spanish, now we post to Guten Tag and we'd expect that to be a 404, but it's not. We end up getting a crash. So we had the, we kind of lied here a little bit. A partial function in Scala ends up extending a total function. So HTTP routes is also an HTTP app when part of the point of HTTP routes was that it is not an HTTP app. You need an explicit way to seal the service to make sure that you're handling all of your cases. So we're going to refine our model again. HTTP app is unchanged, but now HTTP routes, we're going to lift that partial function so it always returns something. It's going to be defined for all requests. It might be defined to return a none, but it is defined for all requests. It's going to return an option of a future of response. And we'll have a nice little wrapper here for creating these HTTP routes. We lose the literal syntax with this, but we just still pass it a partial function directly. So we can see the syntax just still here is pretty good. HTTP routes of instead of just uh, literal case blocks, but it's still okay. Our combine it got a little bit noisier, but it's still not catching exceptions. So we still feel pretty good about that. And we can see here in our HTTP app, when we try to combine it, we'll note that the signature of combine is HTTP routes to HTTP routes returns HTTP routes. That is no longer an HTTP app. The compiler caught our error. It says, hey, you need some way of completing this. You're returning an option of a future, but I need a future. It's not optional to return something. So now we're going to introduce this new function called seal. So seal is a way of taking HTTP routes and turning it into an HTTP app. So you're able to combine routes. You can combine as many of those as you want. If we were supporting German, we could have a third service there, keep combining them. And then we can seal it all at the end. You go from HTTP routes to an HTTP app at that point. And now we've solved our problem. When we post a Guten Tag, which isn't supported yet, we end up getting the not found just like what we would expect instead of a crash. We're making progress here. 
Another thing that you like to be able to do is composition. So I think of combination as taking services and putting them together horizontally. Composition is taking services and putting them together vertically. It's uh, kind of decorating a service with new behavior. So we're going to define this translate. This is what we called a middleware at HTTP for us. It's a function from an HTTP application to another HTTP application. And what it's going to do is it's going to take any response body that comes back and it's going to run it through our translator service. So now we can define services uh, here in the English speaking world, we can define it with hello name and then if we wanna have a Spanish version of the service, we just wrap it inside of our translate middleware. And now when we post to Ola, we see that it works. It returns Ola Boston, even though the original wrap service didn't know anything about translation. Uh, practical reasons you do composition, we have a whole bunch of middlewares defined. We've got things like for doing gzip compression. Uh, we have metrics middleware, so you can gather uh, metrics in terms of your response latencies. There's a whole bunch of practical applications for composing uh, behavior under applications in this way. Now what we find is maybe we want to be able to apply these middlewares to a subset of our routes. So right now our routing, we see it's from HTTP app to HTTP app. It works for the entire application, but maybe we want to apply it to a subset of our services. So let's take our hello, and in English we want to just have it be the raw routes that we have, and then we want to provide a Spanish endpoint that we apply translation to. But we can't do that. Since we've separated HTTP app from HTTP routes, we can't call these middlewares on just a subset. We now don't have the same subtype relationship anymore. We're not able to do this partially. <clears throat> so here's where we're going to reach into CATS for the first time. CATS has this wonderful thing called Clisely. It's come up a few times already. A Clisely is a, a function of a monadic value. So it's just a big wrapper around A to an F of B. And in our case, the A is a request and the B is a response. Let's see how far we can get with Clisely. So Clisely, a type HTTP, we're going to define this new thing. An HTTP function is a function in some polymorphic effect, that's what the F means. The F is just a container, or effect, context, there's a bunch of words for it, call it what you want. It's just something that has one type parameter. It's going to be a Clisely in some F from a request to a response. And now we can redefine our HTTP application as just HTTP that happens inside the effect of a future. And HTTP routes are just HTTP that happen in the context of an optional future. We define this case class option future because we need something that has one type parameter. It's just so it lines up with that HTTP shape. It's a wrapper so it fits the signature there. Let's see what happens. Now we can define translate, and all we need out of translate is it will work for any monad. We can see that we're taking our application and we're flat mapping over it. A Clisely, you can flat map it, and what you end up with is you take a um, function of the output of the Clisely, the response to another Clisely. So we can do this function composition uh, using Clisely as long as you have a monad. And then we've got our hello just like we always have. And we try to apply that to make our Spanish routes, but it still doesn't work. It doesn't compile because it says we couldn't find an implicit value for evidence parameter of type cat's monad option future. You can't define a monad for an option future. The option is on the outside. So think about how you would try to define a flat map for that. It's impossible to do because you need to know what happens in the future to know what kind of option to return on the outside. The only two ways that you can do that are to do blocking, which we've established are bad, or to have a crystal ball, which we don't have. So option future isn't going to work. Future option does work. So the lesson here is that you can have two monads. You can have future and you can have option. And you can put them together and sometimes you get a monad out, sometimes you don't. It turns out if we flip these around so the future is on the outside, we can define a monad for it. So what we're going to do is we're going to sequence these monads. So the future's on the outside, the option's on the inside. Redefine our service that way. And now we find that it does work. Now that we have a monad instance for the future option, we can call our abstract translate and we can see how we can translate a subset of the routes and then seal it. So we can translate HTTP routes or we can translate an entire application. Our translate middleware now works across whatever context that you're in. So now you can do it partially or you can do it totally. That's pretty cool. While we were looking at Clisely, it's good, we adopted this new type and when I adopt a new type, I like to start to look through the source code and say, okay, what else does this type do for me? 
And going through the course code in Clisley, I see this strange thing, a Clisley semi-group K. I don't know what a semi-group K is. Let's take a look at it. It's this thing that takes an implicit semi-group for type F, but this signature is really interesting. This looks familiar. It looks like something that we were trying to do before, where you take a Clisley and you take another Clisley and you get a Clisley back, and the name of it is combine K. Let's see what's going on here. So we go to the CATS docs and we see an explanation of it that a semi-group K option is something that's universally quantified. It's a way of combining together two options, and the only way that you can combine those options is by or elsing them together. So if we look at the shape of this, this looks like something that we're trying to do, taking a Clisley and another Clisley and combining them into one Clisley, and it has or else-like semantics. This sounds very familiar. So let's see, let's go ahead and define an instance of semi-group K for a future option. We're gonna play a little bit of type Tetris and see if we can come up with something that matches that signature. And what we see here up on the screen works where we call the value, we flat map into it. If there's some value, that's the one that we want. If there isn't a value, if the first one returned none, X returned none, then we want to call off to Y and return that uh, future option. So that gives us or else like semantics inside of a future. And now we've got our English service, we've got our Spanish service, we've got our combine K, which was provided by the Clisley and the seal. So we've gotten rid of that old combine function that we had. That's something that's built in. As long as we have an instance for our context, that's built in directly, and we got that for free from cats by using these standard types. And now when we post to Ola, we find Ola Boston again. So it works. But now our CFO is angry at us. He says, 90% of our users speak English, but we're seeing 10 times the bill from our translation service that we expect. I need you to look into that. Okay, we're gonna write a logging middleware. We're gonna write a logging middleware that says that we're translating. And then we uh, wrap it, so before we make our call to translate, we're also going to wrap that in logs. So our definition of our Spanish service has changed. Let's see what's going on there. We run a unit test and we post a hello. Let's look at the definition of our service again. We should be hitting the English service first. It's defined for hello, so we should be able to get a response out of that. We shouldn't fall through to the Spanish service. And the service is working as far as the user is concerned. They're getting the correct responses, but we can see that side effect has happened in the background. We're calling that translation service even though we're never considering that response because we got that response from the first service. The problem that we have here is that future is eager, and what we're doing when we're doing responses is we might be doing side effects to create our responses. We don't want to be doing side effects for no good. We want to be very controlled about how we got our side effects. This one is merely wasteful, but imagine that we were doing something that was doing just something destructive, like deleting something from a database. If you were accidentally running that, we'd have an even bigger problem. We wouldn't just have the CFO angry at us, we'd have customer service angry at us too. So we need to do better. So future is something that served us pretty well. We need that asynchronicity, but we need something beyond that. We need something that's lazier than a future. And Cat's Effect has something to say about this. It has this type class called sync. Sync is an extension of a monad that adds a little bit of extra functionality. And the key thing that we're looking for here is that a sync is a monad that could suspend the execution of side effects into the F context. And future isn't sync, you can't suspend a future. When you construct a future, it starts running right away. So what we need is we need a new type. And IO is a type that's also provided by Cat's effect. It behaves in a lot of ways like a future. So you can, do you can model asynchronous processes, you can compose things without falling into callbacks, you can flat map over them just like you can with a future. But it also has this way of delaying a side effect until it's evaluated at the end of the world. The end of the world is something that you hear about a lot in functional programming. So the end of the world, it can be the end of your main method. In the case of our slide deck here, the end of the world is our unit tests. That's a common end of the world. Or in the context of an HTTP server backend, the end of the world is the end of the request cycle where you're running the response that your service returned. Those are all ends of the world. But we're able to delay those effects until they happen. Let's redefine our service now, so instead of having a future option, everywhere that we saw future before, we now see IO. That's the only difference. That's cool, that was a pretty simple translation, but now we've got a new hassle, because remember we had a monad, we had to define a monad for future options so we could do uh, composition. We had to define a semi-group K so we could do combination of services, and we've got to do all of that again for IO. So uh, I don't want to dwell on this slide, slide. I want to keep moving things along, so we're going to move quickly. 
Uh, if you want to implement your, this yourself, if you're just getting used to this style of programming, implementing this type is a really good exercise for you. If you want to just look at it and stare and learn, I'll be posting these slides later. And if you don't want to learn about it and forget it existed, wait a couple minutes because we're about to make it unnecessary. <laughs> All right, so now we've redefined our service. Instead of being inside a future, we're inside of IO. IO applied delays the side effect that you pass to it. So that's the only real change here. Also, our logging middleware has changed. It now takes a sync constraint, so we're delaying the side effect of saying that we've translated. That was something that was missing from our previous model. And now when we posted the hello endpoint, we can see that we still get the correct response, and we also see that the translate is not running. Now that we're lazy in our effects, we're only running them when we need them. Our CFO is off our back. Everything is good. It was kind of a drag, though, that we had to define We've gone through this exercise of handcrafting these instances for a future option and handcrafting these op instances for an IO option. If we decide there's some shiny new type out there, we're going to have to go through this exercise again. It seems like that's something that should be generic, and it is. CATS provides this data type called option T, and what it is is it's a light wrapper on an F of option A, which is exactly what we have. We had a future of an option A, we had an IO of an option A, those are all instances of an F of option A. So what an option T is, is it's a monad transformer. So you take an option and you can bury it inside of another monad. And this is a very convenient wrapper that gives you a monad instance. It gives you a sync instance. All uh, syncs are monads. And it also gives you a semi-group K instance. So if we can express our service in terms of option T, then we get all those things for free. So version eight of our service, we're going to redefine things. Our HTTP app is still unchanged. Or no, I'm sorry, our HTTP app is changed. We're now parameterizing HTTP app over some base monad. We're no longer committing to IO. And one reason that we're no longer committing to IO is we want to be able to use this option T. So HTTP app and HTTP routes, those now are also parameterized on their context. We're going to call that the base monad. And for an HTTP app, that's just an HTTP function that is in the base monad. You need an IO out. And then for HTTP routes, we're going to say, it's an option T over F, and IO is going to be the common construction for that. Let's take a look at that. Now when we define our routes, we have to say that what our base monad is, so IO. We've had to add that, but in exchange for that, we've gotten rid of all those artisanally handcrafted instances. And when we run that, we can see that we post to it, and our service works well inside of an option T. Our hello service is interesting. Note that it's parameterized now over F. Our hello service doesn't refer to IO anymore. And it seems like we paid a lot of cost there to get rid of just having to define those instances because you define those instances once and you forget it. So maybe that was expensive, but we did get something pretty neat out of this. So there's another library out there called Monix. And Monix is getting a lot of uh, attention lately. There's a really great blog post uh, this morning by Alexander, he's the primary author of Monix, that compares IO to another type that Monix provides, it's called a task. And there are some various things, IO is a little bit simpler, task has some different ideas on scheduling fairness and things like that. They're both really great types. The neat thing is now that we've defined our service that way in terms of type classes and parameterized types, is all we need to do to have Monix support is everywhere we said IO before, we said task, boom, we have Monix support. So you can pick your base monad depending on what level of complexity and dependencies that you want, and it will work as long as you have a sync instance, as long as you have a semi-group K instance, you're ready to go. Let's move on to another uh, problem that we have with our service. So in honor of being in Boston, I'd like to translate the midnight ride of Paul Revere. So we're going to define an application where we post to the translate endpoint. We had something like this on an earlier slide, but now we're all parameterized over F. It's a little bit different than it was before. When I try to translate the midnight ride to Paul Revere, I get a little bit uncomfortable. So I am an engineer. I'm not a humanities major. I have no idea how long the midnight ride of Paul Revere is. Is it a few paragraphs? Is it a thousand pages? I don't remember. I'm an engineer. What I do know is that it's longer than my slide, and as a server operator, I'm already really uncomfortable, because what I see is I'm not getting any incremental output. I have to wait for the entire Paul Revere's midnight ride to be translated before I get any response. And I also have to worry that it's buffering that entire response into memory. I need to worry about the memory consumption on my server. 
HTTP has this concept of chunk transfer encoding, so you're able to start emitting results before you have fully uh, computed the response. It's able to give you incremental updates and then uh, at the end it gives you an empty chunk and that's how you know that an HTTP response is done. We should have an HTTP library that supports that. So we're going to change up our request and our response a little bit. We're going to replace the string body that we had before with a stream, and our streaming implementation is going to be FS2. I don't have time to give a full overview of FS2 and how that works. Uh, Fabio will be talking about that later. We're just gonna hand wave it at, at it a little bit and see what it buys us. Uh, basically what a stream does is it provides you an output type, so we're going to have a stream of bytes, and those can be evaluated in some F context. And the reason the stream has an F context is so that way you can track your side effects because you can materialize a stream, say you wanna read a file, that's something that happens inside of IO. So you would have a stream of IO to byte. FS2 gives you a whole bunch of functions for doing that sort of thing. So every stream it has an effect and it has an output type. And when we put that F there on our body, that meant that we had to put a type parameter on request and response. We have to declare what type of effect the request and the response run in. Probably running out of time here, so let's do our final version of what an HTTP app and HTTP routes are. So now we're going to see our HTTP Clisely function, it actually operates in two contexts. So it's got an F, and what the F is, is it's a representation of what effect the response is turned in, and then the G is a representation of what effect the stream runs in. And we, when we think about an HTTP app, what we want that to be is we want that to be a wrapper of a request in some effect F to an F of some response in effect F. And what that expresses is that expresses a total function so we can uh, run the effects of the request, we can decode it into some F type, and then we can map over that F type, and then we get an F response out. That's something that works out very nicely. HTTP routes, we still need that concept of optionality. So what we're doing there is we're applying the option monad transformer to the uh, request effect type. So HTTP routes ends up being an option transformer F. The syntax you see here is provided by kind projector, by the way. I failed to mention that earlier. Now let's redefine our service. Let's say we've got a streaming backend in addition to our future-based backend. So right here in the middle on that line, body through, now that we've got a binary body, what we do is we take that body and we need to decode that. We're going to go from a stream of F to byte to a stream of F to st strings. And those are going to be English strings. And we're going to pass that to our translator service. And that's going to be a uh, pipe that goes from a stream of strings to another stream of strings. But it'll be English streams coming in and Spanish strings coming out. And then we're going to run that through the UTF-8 encoder because we need to go back to bytes. HTTP uh, bodies are a binary protocol by default, so we need to encode those on the way out. That's our call to a uh, streaming backend. And now to run this, what we can see is we call the app. We're going to build up a request. Instead of Paul Revere's Midnight Ride as a strict body, we're going to stream Paul Revere's Midnight Ride because, again, I'm an engineer. I don't remember how long it is. Now we take that IO response and to actually deal with this, this is an example of dealing with FS2 code. We're not gonna go too deep into this. If you like this, please come to Fabio's talk later today. We're going to lift that IO response into a stream of response. Now we flat map that to get the body. We decode that to get strings. We're going to take the first five lines that come off of it. We're gonna compile it down to a list. When we get that list inside of some context, we're going to map that down to make a string to jam it all together. And now we've got an F of a string. Remember, everything is a delayed side effect. Now we're at the end of the world. At the end of the world, we can call unsafe run sync. And when we do that, we can see the first five lines of the translation of Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. So we can see that we're getting things incrementally now and we're getting things in constant space. Maybe if Paul Revere's Midnight Ride is actually thousands of pages long, maybe it's still translating there on the back end. I don't care, I got what I needed out of this right away. So now I'd like to talk about some libraries that are out there in the ecosystem. So we're using all these types and cats and cats effect and FS2 and those all solve some real problems for us. But what's really nice is when you get the network effect and use some other things that are out there in the ecosystem. So I'm gonna give a brief tour of a couple other libraries and show all that all snap together. So a lot of applications, they need a configuration. So pure config, it's a wrapper around type safe config. We can see an example of a JDBC configuration there uh, for uh, pure config. And what pure config does is it maps case classes to our configurations defined in type safe config. And it has a cat's effect integration. When you think about configuration, it's something that can fail for a variety of reasons. It can fail because you're reading it off the disk and disks can fail. 
and it can fail more commonly because you've got a typo and you're off in this uncompiled thing and you've got a typo and it doesn't map cleanly to your case class. And anything that can fail, that's what we want to wrap in an IO type. One of the things that we get from an IO type is bad things can happen inside of this. So it's convenient to be able to load up a config as an IO. So hold that thought. Another library that snaps nicely together is Doobie. It's written by Rob Norris, one of our MCs here. Uh, Doobie has this notion of a transactor. You can think of a transactor as a way of doing connection management. It gives you connections, it runs things, it cleans up the connection for you so you don't have to think about all those triply nested JDBC blocks that you used to have to do. And then we've got this numbers query. So we pass a transactor to numbers and Doobie also has this insight that a JDBC result set and an FS2 stream are things that fit together very well because it's an effectful thing. It's something that happens in IO. It's not referentially transparent. So you want to put that in IO and it's something where you might get an unreasonably large result set. So it's convenient to be able to treat those as a stream. So you're able to take an arbitrary query. We have the type that the query returns. We return a stream and we call transactor on it and it gives us back a stream. So that's cool. Uh, further tutorial on Doobie's out of scope, but it has the basic shape that we need. Uh, John FS2 is a little library that I wrote. So John is a library that comes from Eric Osheim, who's also here. John is an incremental JSON parser. Very often you're going to have very large JSON bodies that are wrapped either inside of an array or maybe they're new line delimited. And you can parse those incrementally. You want to start getting the values out one by one. So I wrote something that was a wrapper around John that takes that incremental output and turns that into an FS2 stream as well. And that uh, call comes from this unwrapped JSON array that we see here. And we're able to take that and in a streaming fashion, it would be a better demo if this JSON were really big, but we're able to uh, print those out one by one as we parse those. Let's try to put this all together. So these types that I've been talking about so far, the HTTP app and HTTP routes, those are something that will be coming in HTTP for S 1.0. The design is coming together on that. I was up late with Chris Davenport last night talking about that actually. What we're going to see here is going to be based on the production version of HTTP for S, that's uh, 0.18.3. And we have this concept of an HTTP service. We don't have a distinction between apps and routes right now. Everything returns an option and we make the responsibility of sealing off that service something that the backend has to implement. So the type here is a little bit different, but we're going to see something that is an actual real honest HTTP for us service. So what we do is we pass it a bunch of routes. So we're going to take a request. We're not going to be picky. We're just going to respond to all requests with this. We're going to call that numbers query from Doobie. Recall that that returns a stream of tuples from integers to the names. And then we're going to use Circe, where we're going to use JSON literals. And we're going to take that tuple and encode it as a JSON. And now at that point, what do we have? Well, we mapped over a stream of tuples to a stream of JSON. So now we have a stream of JSON. HTTP for us has this idea of entity um, encoders and entity decoders. So for a lot of common types, it knows how to take those types and serialize and deserialize those into a stream of bytes. So all we need to do is say we're going to respond OK and we're going to take the uh, stream of JSON and that's something that we know how to encode into a stream of bytes. So now we've got our F of response to F or our IO of response to IO in this case. And now let's put it all together. So this program, everything you see on the right hand side, this is all in a four comprehension, is going to operate in the IO context. We're going to put it all together and see if we can build a program. So we're going to load the config, as we discussed, via pure config, that happens inside of IO. We're going to create a Doobie transactor to talk to an H2 database. This entire slideshow is compiled, so everything that you see here is real. We're going to create an in-memory database, and then we're going to set it up with or, sorry, for our Doobie example, we're going to call setup. That's just something we need to do because we're inside of a slideshow to make it all tick. And then inside of our slideshow, we're going to start a server. So we're going to use our native Blaze backend for that. The way you do that in HTTP for S is with a Blaze builder. We're going to mount that application. The application has a dependency on the transactor. So it's app, and then we apply the XA to it. We're going to bind that to port 8080, and we're going to start that. That's going to give us an IO of a server. That start name is maybe a little bit misleading. It doesn't actually start the server right away. It gives you an IO server. And then HTTP one client, that's how we create a client in HTTP for S. We're going to create a request, which is just going to be a GET request to uh, localhost port 8080. 
and then on our client API, we call fetch, we pass it the request, and then as part of the HTTP for us client API, you need to give it a callback of the response, and that callback is something that returns an IO of some type, it's dealing with the response, and then you have to fully consume the response inside of that callback, because once that IO type, or whatever F context you're operating in completes, we need to be able to um, release the connection for connection pooling reasons. That's why it's designed the way that it is. In that parse response, we call this helper here that calls the John FS2 that takes however big a JSON it is and starts to incrementally spit things out. And then when everything is done, we shut down the client and we shut down the server. And at the end, we should have a list of the first three uh, JSON elements that get output by the service. We call it and we run it, and there it is. We fired up a server, we fired up a client, and we started streaming results from the database, grabbed the first three, and shut everything down cleanly. So uh, that's how it all fits together. I had a bonus talking point here in case I talk too fast. Looking at the clock, I did not talk too fast, but I just want to briefly hand wave at this. This is something that's really interesting to me. Uh, user uh, Itamar Avid came up with this. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He observed that the cont t monad is something that ends up looking a lot like the ACA HTTP directives. So if you're writing ACA HTTP services, but you're interested in this functional style of programming, this might be something where we can pull that in, and then you would have HTTP directives would be something inside of a cont t an HTTP applied to cont t, and then we would be able to do all this composition and combination just the same as you can with routing. It's an alternative way of looking at routing. I thought it was a neat observation. Uh, acknowledgements, we've got a lot of maintainers of HTTP for us made it out here today. Uh, some of these people look a lot like their avatar, some of these people look nothing like their avatar. Uh, some of these people came from very far away. Some of these people made the grueling trip all the way up from Rhode Island. But anyway, I owe a great deal of gratitude to all of these people, and I suggest you go meet these people if you haven't. They are all wonderful, and I'm very thankful for everything they've contributed to the project. Uh, finally, uh, I said I don't like to talk about myself. I do like to talk about my work because I'm very excited about my work. Uh, I'm working at Formation. One thing that I've heard quite a bit uh, over the course of this week is, oh, you're doing Haskell now. That's true, I am doing Haskell, but we also do a lot of Scala. So if you're interested in doing functional Scala, if you're interested in transitioning to Haskell, or in my case, I'm interested in doing a mix. If you're interested in doing a mix and you like to apply that to machine learning or big data and you don't want to move to San Francisco, I still live in Indiana, we're remote friendly. If any of that appeals to you, uh, we are hiring for all those positions in a lot of locations and I would love to talk to you. All right, that's all I have.